I'm delighted to be with you today, oh, man. Um, especially so. Um, I don't know if this is working entirely, but if not, I'll holler. I'm delighted to be with you today. Um, and honored to receive this award. And I must say that my birthday that will be upon me in a week from today is one which I will gladly celebrate, of course, and my family with me. Um, I feel like sort of a young whippersnapper in this room, I've got to tell you. I'm so honored and, and, and impressed by the, the liveliness and the energy and the involvement in life of so many people that I've already met this morning, and I commend you for that. It is stimulating and motivating for me to be with so many people who have your attitude and your view of life, that long, extended, vibrant view of life, which, which I feel like I embrace, but intend to embrace it even more now after this great award from your organization. When I was born in 1940, I know you've already done the math, I was born in 1940, um, back in Baltimore, Maryland. Life was fine, and in, when I was five years old, 1945, I contracted the measles, and as many of you know in this room, in 1945, when a child got sick or had a high fever, the parents didn't rush him off to the doctor, didn't rush him off to the hospital, put an ice bag on his head. Well, my temperature got so high that I lost the hearing in my right ear. And so my parents finally took me to the doctor because they saw that I was, up, uh, I was acting differently. I didn't respond to them always or as well or as quickly. So they determined that because of the fever that I suffered, I lost hearing in my right ear. And it disintegrated the nerve in my inner ear and there was no surgery that could be done. So I've been deaf in one ear since 1945. Well, that could be a curse, but for me instead it became a blessing. And the blessing was, in those days when you were in school, and I was a student at five years of age, not yet a teacher, of course, uh, they seated you alphabetically. And as an S, Scherholz, I was in the back of the room. And I had a very difficult time hearing the teachers talk. And I, I was not doing quite well in school. So my parents intervened, went up and met with the teacher and the principal, and they said, please move our son to the front row, which they did. And that taught me two things. One, my parents really cared about me. And two, that I could really hear the teacher and understand what she was talking about. And three, more importantly, I recognized the importance of attentive listening, which I've utilized all the rest of my life, thank God. And for any of you here who have not yet started that practice, think, do it. I mean, when you listen attentively to people, you honor them, you respect them, number one but you get more from them, you get more from what you're hearing. So it has been a blessing for me, and I have been, been that attentive listener uh, all of my life. And it's helped me in, in my academic life, in my academic world, my per professional world, for sure. So fast forward through all the wonderful teenage years, which I won't bore you with, and my young adult years, and now here I am in college at 17. I started college at 17 at Towson, then Towson State Teachers College. Uh, the ratio of four women to one guy w was fairly attractive, but it wasn't the reason that I went there. <laughs> Actually, it was very attractive. Um, and in so, in, with that ratio, if you could chew gum and walk at the same time, you were asked to play on virtually every athletic team we had at Towson State Teachers College, which I did. And also to perform in every musical that the school put on, because there were male roles and male parts that had to be filled by males. And so every, all those of us who played on the soccer team and the baseball team were recruited all the time to perform in the musicals at Towson State Teachers College. I sang in one wonderful town, you know the name of that, wonderful town, I sang with two people. The, the female uh, lead, believe it or not, her name was Bernie Thrush. And she sang like that. <laughs> she, ended up singing, she ended up singing with the Fred Waring singers. The male singer was Spiro Malice, who had a chest about like this. And in our auditorium, which was, was sloped and old windows, when Spiro hit his note, that big baritone voice, you could feel the window shake. He went on to sing in the, for the Metro, New York Metropolitan Opera for some 15 years. I, on the other hand, played, a, <laughs> played the role of an Irish policeman and, one, and had a solo to sing. And I'll never forget it. They put the, the spotlight on me, I knelt down on one knee, and I took off my policeman's cap and sang Darling Eileen. 
I won't do that to you now. <laughs> but I love singing. I love to sing. I love music. I love interaction. I love life. I love people. And as it turned out, I went through Towson. I played soccer for four years and baseball for four years and did well, but not as well as I could have done academically. But when I got to Loyola College for my master's degree work, where I was thriving to become a principal, so ma uh, majoring in administration and supervision of secondary schools, that was where I was going. Just about made it to the end. Two courses shy of my master's degree. And one day, while still teaching school, I decided to write a letter. Instead of going to the faculty room and chatting it up with my buddies, I decided to write a letter to the Baltimore Orioles, my hometown baseball team, to the owner of the Baltimore Orioles. Didn't know they were looking for anyone to fill the position. So I wrote this letter to the owner. He forwarded it to a fellow who was the president of the club, who sent it to the general manager of the club, who sent it to the newly appointed director of player development, who had himself been an assistant until a week before. They were looking for the new assistant, the lowest rung of the administrative ladder in Major League Baseball, the young boy in the office, the glorified gopher. That's what they were looking for. So my letter happened to arrive at that very time. My family name was very well known in, in the circle, athletic circles in Baltimore. My grandfather was a remarkably talented basketball coach. My father was regarded as the Bob Cousy of his day. My dad also went on to play professional baseball in the minor leagues for four years. But his brothers, my grandfather coached a team that were made up of all Sherholz boys, my father and his brothers. <laughs> And the guy who was then the president of the Baltimore Orioles named Frank Cashin, God rest his soul, he just passed away, was before that a sports writer. And he said, wow, this guy comes from the Sherholz clan. He must know something about sports. These guys were really well known. This is a good sports family. Let's bring him in and give him an opportunity to interview. That's what got me in the door. So I get interviewed, I go in, and Frank Cashin meets me and says, hi, John. He gives me a little bit of an inter interview, takes me to Harry Dalton. God rest his soul as well. He's dead. He interviewed me. He takes me to Lou Gorman, who was the most impactful, wonderful person in my life next to my father, Lou Gorman, who was looking for an assistant. God rest his soul. I spoke at his funeral a couple of years ago in, in Massachusetts. What a great man. He interviews me, and they send me home. And so a week or so goes by, and I walk in the door, and I don't have anything small enough to hold up for you to explain to you what I had, but it was a trophy. It was about this big. Our, fac our faculty basketball team just won the Baltimore County Recreation League Championship, basketball championship. I was flying high. I had my trophy, I was feeling good, and there was a message that says, please call Lou Gorman, he would like you to call him back. And I said, oh my God, there it is. Thank you, but no chance. Thank you, but no opportunity. So I said, okay, I'll call Lou. So I called Lou Gorman, and there I was, in my almost the beginning of my fourth year of teaching, and he said, John, Lou Gorman, thanks for calling back. I said, sure, Lou. <laughs> yes? We'd like to offer you the job as the Baltimore Orioles uh, administrative assistant. And I'm telling you, I don't think my feet have touched the ground since. <laughs> I had always, my goal in life was to be a Major League Baseball player. I was pretty good in high school. Uh, I was better in college, but when I was in high school, I had a college, uh, excuse me, a soccer coach who went to Towson State Teachers College, Bob Oliver, and he said, John, what are you going to do for college? I said, I'm going to sign a baseball contract and be a major league baseball player. He said, well, what happens if the scouts sort of overlook your ability? What are you going to do? I said, well, I don't have those plans. He said, well, you should make those plans. He said, you work at the YMCA day camp every summer. You love working with kids. You're good with kids. You got that personality. Why don't you apply to Towson State Teachers College? So I did, to appease my soccer coach. Well, the darn scouts overlooked my ability. <laughs> they didn't offer me a contract. And then, sure enough, I went on to Towson State Teachers College in 1958. And what a remarkable God blessing it, has, it was to go there. I was involved with that ratio of four to one. I did play soccer and baseball all four years. I was an apt and attentive listener and I did very well academically, and I loved every second of it. In fact, I loved it so much that I continued to make donations and, and contributions to the organization, so much so that they named a sports complex after me now. It's called the John Sherholz Park at Towson University in Baltimore, outside of Baltimore, Maryland. 
So that's how my life got started. And off I went in, into, into the life of an educator, which I have never had a job in my life. I've had two. I was an educator and a baseball executive. I've never had a job in my life that I love more than that one. And those of you who are involved in education, and a lot of you are in one way or the other, maybe not directly in teaching students how to become smarter and better and work harder and advance their lives and so on and so forth, but helping people grow, that's education. Helping your family get better, that's education. Those of you who are in that understand exactly what I'm talking about. I can remember to this day teaching the eighth grade, which is what I taught, which was a challenge, trust me. When the girls, the girls and the boys didn't know if they were girls or women or boys or men at the end of each day, it was just crazy. I mean, they were just forming themselves and forming their lives, but it was so exciting. I loved every minute of it. And, and what really what got me was when they would matriculate out of the eighth grade, and in those days when, when schools were, were, were aligned properly, in my, my respectful opinion, where students in junior high school were sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and high school began in the ninth grade, and, and, and when the kids got there, they were ready to deal with the challenges of high school. But I would be in my classroom after class, doing some work, preparing my lesson plans, grading tests, whatever I was doing, and here would come a couple of students who had been students of mine in years past, and they just wanted to chat. They just wanted to, to talk. They wanted to talk about their life and ask me things and what I thought and what would I suggest. And you have to remember, or you have to know, that I, I, taught, I taught English world and world geography. And in English, I taught composition and grammar, literature, spelling, and, and, and so on and so forth. And in world geography, I, I, caught, I also taught current events. But in my room, if you were a, a, an eighth grade student and we were teaching the unit on equatorial Africa, and, I, and, the, and, the, and the kids were, were aligned by IQ test. The very highest IQ people and the very lowest IQ people I had in my class. I taught them both the same unit. I didn't change it up. I changed up how I taught it. In the back of my room, the, the unit on equatorial Africa, we built a hut. And the kids on, in, the lower, in the lower spectrum, I, had, I showed them how to build it. They built a cardboard hut with a slanted roof. They got the reeds from the, from the areas around. They put the reeds on, and we had the room decorated with vines and so on and so forth. And when I was teaching the unit, I had a tape recorder in, the, in, that, in, that, uh, in that hut where we'd play a background of soft sort of African uh, music. And that's the way, that was the environment we had. And then I had the top section create a travel log, an itinerary. And we brought all of the eighth grade students through my class and, and, then the, and the kids who were the, at the higher IQ would present what equatorial Africa is like, how life is, what kind, what's the weather, what's, what's the climate, what's the, what's the industry, what's the commerce, how people lived, what the clothing was like, and so on and so forth. So I love that, as you can tell. I loved being an eighth grade teacher. And then I wrote this letter. I sat down and wrote this letter this free period, and I get called by the Baltimore Orioles, and now my career begins as a, as a young boy in the office, as the glorified gopher. And so thrilled. That so thrilled, in fact, that in my first spring training in 1966 in Fernandina Beach, Florida, which is now a beautiful resort, but it wasn't when I was there in training with the Baltimore <laughs> Orioles, I was so nervous that I had acquired some disease called pityriasis rosea. And some of you may know what that is. I would shake hands and five pounds of skin would come off of my body. I mean, I was so nervous about getting this job. But my career began in 1966. And I said to myself, I'm going to give myself five years to see where I am in this career path of mine. And if I'm not where I think I should be, I will go back to teaching in a heartbeat. I will go back and be an educator. And I, want, I could envision myself growing old, having a beard, putting on a cardigan sweater, maybe smoking a pipe, <laughs> maybe teaching, teaching in some little college with ivy covered walls. Not that one, but little, a smaller one. <laughs> and I was really, really enthused by that. But my, as it turned out, my baseball career worked. I worked for the Baltimore Orioles for three years. Then the Kansas City Royals were awarded an expansion franchise in 1969. And my boss, Lou Gorman, said, I have taken the job with the Kansas City Royals to begin their player development program. And I, you're going with me. I said, Lou, I'm not going with you to Kansas City. I'm, I'm a Baltimore guy. I grew up in the streets of Baltimore. This is where I live. I'm not going to go to Kansas. They have horses and cows walking up and down the street. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a city guy. I'm not doing that. He said, you're going. Well, I went, 
And thank God I went. What a, what a great experience that was to build a Major League Baseball team from the ground up before the very first player was a part of the organization. And so every aspect of constructing an organization uh, and putting legacy in place, and we won faster than any ex uh, expansion team in the history of Major League Baseball had ever won. We got into the playoffs, and it was a wonderful experience for me. I'll never forget it. I spent 23 years there, and as was said in the introduction, uh, of me that the last nine years I was a general manager and I thought I would leave Kansas City in a pine box. I loved it so much. I don't know if you've ever lived in Kansas City. It is a beautiful place to live. Maybe not so much fun to visit, but it's a beautiful place to live. The people are wonderful, Midwestern mores and attitudes and just a spectacular place. I, th I would never leave there. Well, guess what? I did. Things happened in the ownership, ownership uh, exchange happened, happened. The, our, our principal owner, Mr. Ewing Coughlin, was ill with cancer, wanted to see to it that the ball club was put in the proper hands. He sold half of it. And the circumstances around that didn't feel the same to me. About that time, I was on a committee with Stan Kasten, who was the president of the Atlanta Braves, ex-president George Bush, who was also, uh, he owned the Texas Rangers, and a number of other people, called the Player Development Committee. It was a, it was a committee where ex-major league players who were going to transition into real life, we were going to show them how to do it. We were going to prepare them for that transition. It never had been done before. So I was on that committee. Stan and I talked. He said, John, I'm going to leave Bobby Cox in the dugout next year, and I'm looking for a general manager. Do you have any ideas who I might bring in? I knew a lot of guys in the game. They were young, vibrant, smart guys, very, very successful. I said, yeah, I, I know some names. I'll, I'll, I'll. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm going to the airport in the car I had, and, and the, the light went off. I said, hmm, Atlanta. And I've always felt that Atlanta or the city of Dallas, Texas, given the right management leadership, would be a vibrant and successful major league location. You could build something there big and successful and sustain it, and fans would support it. And I remember that. And I said, okay, the Atlanta Braves, which, by the way, was the most <laughs> woeful team in major league baseball. Angela's shaking her head over here. Most woeful team. They had finished last three years in a row. They were the only major league team not to draw a million people. Friends of mine who had gone there said the food was unrecognizable by sight or taste. <laughs> <laughs> there was no such thing. There was no such thing as personal service to the people who were ticket buyers and, and customers and fans. The place was not, not real pretty, not real clean. All of that in my mind, and I'm leaving the IBM of the American League, the Kansas City Royals, if I make this decision. Well, I chose to do it. Kasten was a good talker. Uh, I thought the opportunity to build something fresh and to bring my ideas and leadership and, and encouragement and energy here uh, would be something that we could do. I sure as heck didn't think that we were going to turn it around so fast that we went from worst to first. A team that finished last three years in a row got into the World Series in 1991, as many of you remember, and we played the Minnesota Twins. And you may not remember this, but we were, the Atlanta Braves were, the outdoor world champions in 1991. We did not lose a World Series game outdoors. <laughs> Unfortunately, we played four of them in that damn dome. <laughs> <laughs> and the Twins won. But that began our remarkable run of 14 consecutive division championships, which, by the way, had never been done before in any professional sport and has never been done since. From 1991, 14 consecutive years, we won our division and got into the playoffs and won a World Series, of course, you'll remember 1995. I think most of you who were here will remember the 1995. Go ahead, clap. That's all right. 1995 <laughs> World Championship. <laughs> what, what bothers me most is that some of the media, some of the opiners, some of the opinion makers will say, wow, what a great run the Atlanta Braves had, 14 consecutive division championships, never been done before, yada, 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 yada. And at the end of the sentence is the word but. <laughs> but, but they only won one world championship. And that is true. That's a frustration for me. Why? Because we had so many great players, wonderful people, Bobby Cox, my partner in crime, not crime, my partner in success for 17 years. <laughs> I just brought Bobby back into the fold a couple of days ago in case you may, you may have read that, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, 
we had a wonderful time. And we could have won two or three other world championships. We did not. So I can't say you know, we did. We didn't. But we were good enough. In fact, we had a couple of teams that were better than the 1995 team and should have been world champions or could have been world champions. That didn't happen. But that doesn't diminish my feeling about the greatness of our organization, the Atlanta Braves, and what we've accomplished. We are, we are viewed by the commissioner of baseball. He calls us the gold standard organization in Major League Baseball, Commissioner Seeley, the outgoing commissioner. I've reminded the incoming commissioner how the commi old commissioner feels about it. <laughs> I have served on many committees, as, as was just mentioned in the introduction. Most recently, and the one most talked about of recent times, I was named chairman of the Instant Replay Committee three years ago. And my committee, our committee, which had Joe Torrey and Tony La Russa and a number of other really high, high powerful people on it, uh, we got a great job done for Major League Baseball. We found a way to get most calls called accurately. The umpires, we had to get them in partnership. They were collaborative. They were happy. They embraced it. It was a wonderful partnership, a great committee. We achieved a lot, and it is really functioning very well. I'm so very proud of that. Less than a week ago, Commissioner Seeley called me again. He says, he used to slap me on the face when I saw him. He said, do I have a job for you? OK, what is it now? Now it's the pace of game. I'm the, now the new chairman. You can thank me for that, too. The new chairman of the pace of game committee. They want to make the pace of baseball games faster and quicker. Okay. And I said, wait a second. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a contrarian. I don't, I've never had anybody tell me that they didn't like the pace of the game they just went, a baseball game they went to. I've never had one person yet. They go to relax, have a beer, have a Coke, have a hot dog, talk to their friends, talk to their family, go when they want to go, stay as long as they wish. Quick games, they go home. Long games, they go home a little early. But that's the way it is. Anyway, he's asked me to be chairman, so I have accepted that, and I told him how I felt. I said, we will work on streamlining the, the way the games of baseball are played. So that's what I'm doing now. But most importantly, you may have read just recently, uh, we announced two days ago that we, we altered the leadership, the baseball operations leadership, the general manager and the assistant general manager and director of player development. Uh, I terminated uh, Frank and I have, Frank Ren and I have worked together for 15 years, and you develop a close personal bond when you do that. And that was very, a tough thing for me to do. It got to the point where it was the, the thing that I must do, I had to do for the good of the organization to get back to what we characterize as the Braves way, the way that we won and, and from 1991 for those 15, 16, 17 years. I asked Bobby Cox to join me as a member of the transition team and John Hart, who has been serving uh, us as a senior advisor in scouting, was at one time for 15 years a baseball executive, was executive of the year two years in a row, led the Cleveland Indians and the Texas Rangers into building great organizations and great teams, and he's my best friend in the game. So we have a real good three-man committee that's going to turn the ship around. We're going to hire a good leadership group. We're going to get the Braves back on track. We're going to have our pipeline with, of minor league players replenished again, filled a pipeline, burgeoning with young talent, championship talent, making, matriculating to the major leagues, scouting guys that are doing their job, signing the right players with winning spirit and commitment and integrity that represent you and our community and the Atlanta Braves in a proper fashion. We're going to get back to that. We're going to do that. And we're going to do it with vigor. We're going to do it with excitement. And we're going to do it with commitment. I can give you my word on that. Again, thank you. Maybe that promise will help you forget the ending of this season a bit. <laughs> I mean it sincerely. Thank you all so very much for this honor. I am so very, very honored to be selected by you, this austere group, to have such a meaningful award in my name. I appreciate it so very much. Thank you. So one of the things, and I'm going to follow this closely so I just don't make stuff up, but because um, people that know me know I do that too. But I really wanted to, uh, Bob Costas in the forward, the forward of, the, of your book, Built to Win, uh, said that you're a leader because of your insight into people. And I think that's so critical because I want to spend a minute talking about our organizations and how critical it is uh, to make sure that we're successful. But he said that your insight in people, it allowed you to assemble, maintain, and motivate uh, a consistently effective organization. Are there any more clues um, that you can give this group as they're trying to be effective leaders, build the right organizations for the future? Is there anything you can kind of? I'll give you the most important clue. If you're 
in, ch in charge and responsible for building a successful enterprise, the most important thing you do is to select the right people to work with you in that venture. That's the most important thing all of us do. Uh, no matter how hard we work, no matter how smart we think we are, how, how much knowledge we have, if you don't create the right team to work with you in support in a collaborative fashion and, and, and trust them, honor them, respect them, empower them, motivate them, and guide them, if you do that and you have the right people, you're going to succeed in whatever it is you do. That's my belief. Yeah. And yeah, perfect. It's great. Because in our field, we kind of, uh, a lot of us have been looking at Jim Collins' good to great. And, you know, as mission driven organizations, a lot of times it's easy to settle for just being good. You know, it's like, well, we're doing a good job, but, you know, we really want to be great organizations and focus on that. And he talks about getting the right people on the bus. And when you were talking about that, it's putting, getting the right people there. And when you have a wrong person, you know, I think there's integrity in, in what you just explained that you were doing is, is just, you know, making the changes for the, the better of the organization. I don't, um, I don't know if there's any more to say about that, but let me just go on to say that um, in the book you also said um, that responsible and committed leaders, that there's a, re a responsibility to create as well as to nurture a winning team environment, not just to survive, but to flourish. And can you say a little more about creating that environment? Because I think, I think it'd be good for us to have a few more clues about what that looks like. Well, it goes back to what I just said. You can eat more easily create a winning environment that is nurturing and committed and, and collaborative if you pick the right people. You have to be certain that you pick people who are willing to subjugate their own personal best interests or own desires to the good of the group, to the good of the team, to the good of the organization, and willing to do the jobs that you ask them to do. And when you, when you decide on who it is that you're going to employ, you, you do that due diligence. You, do all, you ask all the questions, you do your interviews, you, you get a feel for the personality of the person, the, the character of the person, the commitment of the person, uh, the trust of the person. And if you do all of that and you hire the right people, that nurturing and, and, and develop uh, team winning environment comes, comes by. You have to then provide a vision and goals and a roadmap of how to reach those goals. But if you get the right people, it all starts pretty easily. Okay. You say that your most valuable lesson was that you learned was to treat people respective, respectfully and to celebrate with them their role in success in the organization. Is there a story that goes with that lesson or is that just something that you learned through the years of your experience? I grew up that way. I grew up in my family, in my, in, under the roof of my home. I grew up in an extended family where that was the way we lived. I mean, we celebrated success. We, we motivated each other. We supported each other. We wanted people to succeed and celebrate it when it happened. And, uh, and I still believe that today. I think uh, you have to challenge people. You have to hire the right people, challenge them. Uh, give them the goal and the, and, and the end point of where you want, want them to be and a way to get there and motivate them along the way and give them the empowerment to do the job. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to succeed. And I keep saying the same thing, but it's really the secret sauce yeah. to any success I've ever had in my life is surrounding myself with really talented, uh, committed, dedicated, honorable people yeah. to want to do the job. That's great. Um, leading age, our, our member organizations are all kinds of mission-driven organizations that uh, provide housing and all kinds of community-based services. We have probably over 150 members now, and our members serve um, over 126,000 older Georgians, and that's, that's a lot of people. Um, and one of the things I'm wondering about that I noticed, and you've said that, um, and, and I really get the feel that you're a bigger picture person, that you're, you're sincerely interested in the well-being of others and I saw that in, in some of in your book about you know really helping people focus on the greater good so my question is if we're serving this many older Georgians and we we feel like that we're the leaders in this field how do we really honor individuals as human beings and for example so somebody's 85, and that doesn't mean that because you're 85, you should take three medicines, you shouldn't go out for walks by yourself because you may fall. How do we, we have so many people from different cultures, different parts of the world, as you know, coming to Atlanta. How do we really make sure that we see an individual as a human being and we aren't um, really prejudging what we think we might see? I'm, I'm a baseball executive. 
and not an expert in that area, but I will say this. If you respect and honor each individual in an individual manner and treat them in that fashion, you will have accomplished what you wish to accomplish. That's, and when you're dealing with large numbers of people, you're dealing with large numbers of individual human beings. And each of those expect and desire to have individual communication and relationships and time with each other. And if you and anyone else in leadership remembers that, that no matter how big the group is, whether it's a 25-man Major League Baseball team, they are, they are individuals who care that you care about them. Wow. Um, I, that's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. So I have to shift now because um, we, we have a consumer center, our Center for Positive Aging. Some of our board members are here today. And we've been having focus groups for the last two years just asking, asking consumers, when you um, – uh, interact with an organization in our field, what do you expect as a quality experience? And you just, you exactly said the answers that we're getting all over the state. I want you to have a relationship with me, know me. I want to have effective communication so I can trust that you're giving me all the choices that I want. And um, the third one is that I want to be at home. So if I, if, I'm, if I live in a nursing home, if I'm living in an individual home and somebody comes in to help me, you know, I want to have those simple pleasures of home, and I, I just had to skip to that because I was like, wow, you just said it. Let me, let me if I may, Go let ahead. me interrupt. I wrote a poem after spending about three days with a man whose ego was so big it would not fit in this room. <laughs> and, it, and it's so apt to what we're talking about now. The poem is, I and my are words oft used by those who are themselves confused. Why won't their super egos trust the use of words like we and us. And if you're in a group setting, in your group responsibilities, that poem will serve you well. That, wow, that's good. I love that. <laughs> so we're going through a lot of change in our field. You, you were talking about the changes that, that you are um, involved with just this week. And um, we're, we have a lot of change in our field. A lot of them are obvious. There's so many more. Uh, people growing older, we're calling it the aging tsunami. Um, and so there's more people that will need care and services and housing and support. And so um, we've been thinking a lot about that. And in change, also because there's more people, we have regulatory changes. Um, there's movements in our field to be more person-centered, where we really know a person and take the time to um, let them be involved in, in their choices instead of us knowing what they need, of course. And, and um, even financial models are changing, you know, serving more people with less funds. And so our members do a really great job of establishing foundations and getting community, building community partnerships and stuff. But with change, I'd really like to see if you could speak to that because I, I feel you, you've had so many changes. I mean, just think of like how many presidents, how many governors, uh, the, the population of Georgia has doubled probably since you've been here. And just thinking about change, is there anything that you can say that helps us really um, sure. be intentional about embracing change and seeing and not feeling afraid of it? Samantha and I had a conversation prior to this, this event beginning, and she told me proudly that she had read my book, Way to go, Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> and called out that particular section in, uh, which I wrote about change and understanding change, embracing change, and managing change effectively. I wrote that because each spring I would talk to our staff members about the responsibilities they have going into each and every new season about understanding who our players were, what the new mix of our group was, and the changes that will come as a result of that and how to deal effectively with them. You first have to be not daunted by change. Change is so much a part of our life on a daily yes. basis now, you have to embrace it yes. and not fight it and then understand it and then work at it and then manage it effectively. You can do that and I think if you do that, it, uh, your, your program will be more successful. Okay. The change is gonna happen so we have to be comfortable with it. Yeah, great. Um, can you tell us about, just share with us, um, a most memorable moment in your career from a feel-good point of uh, something great? My career or my life? Life. How about your whole life? Well, I told one story in 1945 when I learned, when, when people learned that I had, had a little bit of a disability and 
they, they, they focused on what it was, and, and good people in my life, adults, my parents and others, focused me on a, on a corrective path, and that was a significant part of my life. Uh, when I was married, when my, when my children were born, when, when, I, when my granddaughters and grandson, he's only about nine months old now, sit on my lap, and, and from a professional standpoint, when I hoisted two World Series championships, one in 1985 and one in 1995 here in Atlanta, one in 85 in Kansas City, one in 95, you get into this business of professional baseball, Major League Baseball, and I've been there for 48 years with one goal in mind, to become world champions. And when you can achieve that, even if you get close, that's exhilarating, and, and that's, you feel good about that. But when you finally hold that trophy in your hand, on a professional standpoint, it gets no better in our business than that. Yeah, awesome. That's great. Now, on the other side, what stands out as kind of a most difficult moment? And can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, two days ago. I was getting ready to uh, say, it may be going on right now. Right? When, when, when decisions like this are made, they're, they're, they're contemplative, they're, they're, di they're dissected, they're, they're thought about, you're prayed about and you make the decision that you think is best for the overall good of the we and the us, not the eyes and the mys. Mm -hmm. And it impacts human beings. No matter the decision you make, if you make the decision to terminate people, as I, as I did several days ago, it impacts human beings. And when you sit down and talk with those individuals individually, you have the feeling of a compassionate human being. Your heart hurts, your emotions are, are rough, but you have done what you think is best. As difficult as it feels at that moment, you have done what you believe is best for your, your corporation, your company, your enterprise. And that's how I felt. What about something that really surprised you? Maybe you were working on and, and you had to make adjustments or changes uh, in order for it to work out well, or just a, like a big surprise that you had to just kind of turn and go in a different direction or or something like that. Can you think of a example? I, I really can at this moment, but that's a, that's a that's a stumper. Uh, I've never I've never signed a, a pitcher that I thought was right-handed and found out he was left-handed. I just can tell you that. <laughs> okay. So I've never had big surprises like that occur to me. So. Okay. So um, actually, that's a good answer because that means you're planned and prepared, right? So um, a lot of us have daily surprises, don't we? That's like a resident drives through the back door of the building or something like that. Okay. All right. So. Um, Anyway, um, so I just want to zero in on a, a couple of last uh, questions. And um, so next week, you have a birthday. You'll be 74 years old. And as you continue grow, growing older and experiencing that and you're on your journey and um, you, you continue to gain experiences and everything, what are you discovering new, maybe about yourself, your style, your focus or something as you are on this journey? Most of my friends, my good golfing buddies, have all retired some 10, 11 years ago. And they expected I was going to follow. I had a plan. In fact, I invested in a couple of pieces of property that were going to be my retirement locations where I could play golf and enjoy myself. But I found that I could not leave my work. I could not leave uh, engagement in life at this level. And I, and I chose not to do that. I play golf fitfully, uh, and it reflects in my scores. Uh, I, I, I love being with my friends. I miss the time they have together. I'm a little sometimes envious and jealous. That's not the right word, but that they have together and enjoying their, their company and their friendship to a greater and deeper degree than I'm able to. But when I'm there, I enjoy it as greatly and as deeply as they do. And those are fun times uh, that we, we share together. So I've learned that, that I, I need to work. Uh, I enjoy work. I don't need to work. I enjoy working. I enjoy what I do. I'm in, uh, enthused by it. I'm energized by it. Um, and I hope to continue to work. God-given good health allows me to do that. And when I stopped working, I was an art major in high school. I was going to be a commercial artist. Mm -hmm. And I have not had the brush in my hand since I joined a baseball team 48 years ago. So when I do stop working, I promise you, if you're ever in any art classes, you may see me sitting next to you. Okay. <laughs> That's my goal. And to play a little golf as well. And, and to play with my grandchildren as much as I can. Good. And what do you want your legacy to be? And are you doing anything to work on that, or is it just evolving no. naturally? I, I, well, I'm do, what I'm doing to work on it is to be myself and, and to be honorable, to be respectful, to be committed, to be hardworking, to be good at what I do. And if people say that about my legacy, if all that fits on a tombstone, I'll be happy. Mm. So, yeah, that's great. So, last question. 
So as life continues to unfold for you, and you think about yourself and the ones that you love, um, what are the last comments, the, any last comments that you would like to leave to what we think these are the key leaders of aging services in our state? Any last comments to them? Love each other, respect each other, um, work together. Um, this is a tough world now. There's a lot of challenges in our world, a lot of dangers, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of mean things happening in our world. And those of you who sit here together in community with one another, in, in support of one another, love one another, respect one another, and work together to make the world a better place. I've always said if I ever was elected to some office where I, had, I was in charge or whatever that was, Grand Poobah or whatever you want to call me, I would want all of the good people in the world on my team. And we would take on all the bad people and kick their butt. <laughs> yes, I love that. Okay, thank you so much.